the mediated environment, we were saying, sitting next to where Peter is now sitting, next to Nicholas, we were five feet away from Peter and saying, indeed, it is much easier to watch Peter on television than to see him, because we can do both in this room. I don't know if you can do both in the other rooms. Um, it softens the image. It pulls it together. It also will allow us in this room, in the soft room, to have an action replay of something we missed at the very beginning when the sound wasn't working. That is Elizabeth Boyarsky's uh, talk. And that will occur after Rem Koolhaas finishes his talk, somewhere after five. Um, Rem is going to be showing slides. And therefore, we can only see him in reality, not on the reproduction. I might just mention, to go back to the holographic view of the universe and the holographic view of the AA, REM comes from a period which Bernard does, the 1970s, and continues into the 80s. And if one looks at the people who are speaking today, my only, the way in which the model doesn't work of the hologram, which is all over and everywhere like the human brain, in every room, reproducing itself, getting an imperfect but similar image in, in interpretation, is that we don't have anyone speaking from the last two or three years. Maybe they can be speaking at the end. But I give you Rem Koolhaas, who will be talking about Atlanta. Rem. Uh, can we have... Um, I want to uh, just remind uh, you and myself of the first time uh, I ever met Alvin. He was giving a lecture on Chicago. Uh, as he was talking about the skyline, he was lyrical and idealistic. As he was walking about, talking about the elevated, he was uh, exhilarating. Uh, as he was descending to the ground, he was pedestrian. But as he lowered and lowered himself, uh, in his interest, and I was finally uh, talking about the entrails of architecture, the underground Chicago. He became positively sulfurous and had a kind of devilish glow and relish about the dangerous uh, elements uh, of architecture uh, he was uh, discussing. Uh, that Alvin probably uh, uh, influenced uh, to some degree my subconscious, and uh, to some extent I would like to dedicate uh, this lecture to the lack of sentimentality that he was uh, displaying then and also to the evident pleasure in which he was uh, discussing dangerous situations in architecture. Uh, can, can the slides be made to work? And then focused. I want to talk about Atlanta um, because at some point in the life of a working architect it becomes more important to know what the city is than what the city was or what the city could have been. And in that sense I've been recently on a, a form of tourism of three particular cities and I want to talk about Atlanta now because I think it is the most uh, interesting. Uh, Okay, I will talk therefore about the city of Atlanta. Uh, and it was this drive to know uh, what the city is at this moment, regardless of any theory or uh, any uh, uh, other extraneous uh, perception that drove me to Atlanta because I had uh, an intuition that in Atlanta, the reality of the present city, the reality of the city at the end of the 20th century could be found. Atlanta is a typical city. Uh, it has an airport, or rather, it has uh, 400 airports. It would be great if the slides coincided with the screen. So yes? That is too complicated for me. Uh, uh, so it has, maybe in the meantime, uh, I will kind of tell a second, uh, uh, a second anecdote about Alvin which in a way uh, reinforced my uh, affinity with him. 
uh, and which also reinforced my, my impression of him as somebody without ultimately sentimentality. It was a lecture by Louis Kahn uh, in the lecture hall. The lecture hall was incredibly filled to, to capacity and Louis Kahn was uh, uh, at that point probably nearing the end of his life. And he was talking about architecture in an extremely idealistic uh, way and he was talking about how two boys sitting um, on uh, the staircase of an important building in Philadelphia were talking about <laughs> wanting to be an architect and how he as an elderly gentleman was um, passing them by and kind of taking them by their hand and kind of making a little walk with them toward other important buildings uh, in the city. At that point, I, I somehow couldn't stand the atmosphere anymore, the, the kind of oozing respect for architecture, <coughs> oozing self-love and oozing condescension. So discreet, as discreetly uh, as possible, I slide, slid toward the ground and kind of between the legs of the uh, people uh, in front of me, I was on uh, hands and knees, kind of finding a way out until I kind of suddenly saw that there was another person in the same position <laughs> uh, just in front of me, uh, uh, also uh, kind of take, making a quick uh, exit from the room. And that person turned to be Alvin and the only word he said was crap. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so um, uh, Atlanta has an airport, but it ha actually had, has uh, 40 airports. Uh, are we switching to manual? <laughs> Uh, uh, it has uh, history, or rather it used to have history, and therefore it has a history, uh, now history machine, uh, which is uh, reproduced uh, every hour uh, on the hour, uh, repeating and playing the Civil War. Then there will be a next slide. Uh, excuse me, can we interrupt this lecture and make sure that uh, this... But are you going now to feed it kind of every single one of them individually? It's dealt? Okay. Okay. Atlanta, because this was supposed to be a very driving sequence of things Atlanta had or uh, thought it had, and now it has been fragmented in maybe a very modern way. Atlanta has culture, or at least it has a Richard Meyer Museum. Uh, Atlanta has a black mayor and it has the Olympics. It will have the Olympics. Uh, Atlanta has uh, architecture, or at least it has architects. Uh, Atlanta has a zoning law, uh, but the first rule of the zoning law is this one, to obtain a zone to obtain a zone change, the applicant must file. In other words, the law is there only to be broken. And in this Atlanta was, uh, in the beginning of the 70s, when I was first, the first in America, the uh, implausible subject of a renaissance, a rebirth of the idea of the American city, a rebirth of the American idea of downtown. And all this rebirth was in essence centered around a single uh, ab absolutely important figure, the architect John Portman, who had designed in 72 the first of his famous hotels, uh, of which this is an image and who introduced, or maybe the word is unleashed on the world, the uh, unusual hybrid, uh, or the, and the poisonous hybrid maybe, of the architect-developer. The architect as developer, the developer as architect. And through the means of this uh, almost perpetual mobile, where the architect could pay for his own architecture, make money on his own architecture, and then develop the next block, became, in a way, the uh, beginning of this rebirth, this apparent rebirth of the city of Atlanta. The fact that this rebirth of the city was all uh, uh, triggered uh, and all generated by the brain of a single man became soon very uh, uh, oppressively noticeable because it was not enough to fill more and more blocks of the city with his own architecture, usually without very interesting programs, but as a further uh, consolidation of the power of the developer architect, each building was connected to each of the other bu building with a bridge. 
in the end uh, creating a system of uh, connected buildings where at some point there was almost no need to ever uh, enter downtown anymore. So that was the paradox of the rediscovery of downtown, that it uh, generated a complex of buildings that uh, made it possible never to be downtown anymore. All this was done uh, with a considerable artistic pretension. This is a page of a book by John Portman, on John Portman, uh, uh, and it says, I consider architecture frozen music. Also, if, uh, and this was uh, done on a kind of secret visit uh, to his office, or rather it was not secret because uh, one of the most exciting experience of a parallel life that uh, uh, I ever had was going to Atlanta uh, and being completely unnoticeable in the sense that nobody knew my name, nobody knew our work, and when we came to visit an office they thought we were the second stringer of a Dutch magazine called Metropolitan Architecture which uh, had uh, unusual uh, interest in their work. Uh, and other, so that allowed me to, uh, to uh, infiltrate the offices, to infiltrate Portman's uh, workroom, which was filled with hundreds of his own paintings, uh, out of this is one. And finally, also to take a secret picture of the spider in the center of his web, uh, uh, Mr. Portman uh, himself, uh, in a typical pose. Now, what was uh, the, uh, both the glory and the undoing of the rebirth of the uh, American city and uh, of the rebirth of the American downtown was Portman's invention of the atrium. Because, of course, the atrium is only the instrument which exacerbates this uh, contradiction where uh, a building uh, benefits uh, from the fact of being downtown, but then in its interior, arranges a replica of downtown as complete ultimately or supposedly as complete as the downtown itself is and therefore forming a competitive universe with downtown and with all the other buildings in downtown so that the city as a whole uh, uh, enters a condition uh, which is no longer complementary but strictly competitive. The atrium uh, at its maybe most extravagant, uh, the most in a way the most astonishing space uh, designed uh, in the 20th century is the atrium of the Marriott Hilton in, of, uh, designed by Portman and uh, needless to say developed by Portman in downtown Atlanta, uh, which is uh, an astonishing uh, 30 or 40 story uh, void, uh, inspired according to Portman both by uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, obviously, but also in a considerable extent by Le Corbusier. And it is a kind of typical anticlimax uh, of the uh, final part of the 20th century that a building which is at the same time so incredibly incredible, so astonishing, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, has, could be described also as a, a building completely <coughs> devoid of qualities. So in the end, uh, this, the success of Portman became his undoing. Uh, his downtown uh, began to uh, undergo a kind of implosive phase, and the real events or the real Atlanta, even after six-year-long uh, revival of downtown, started to move to uh, a territory beyond a completely uncharted territory, which uh, where uh, uh, for inexplicable reasons, big or biggish or even enormous buildings were uh, rising from uh, a nature which uh, uh, during the Vietnam Wars, because of its almost tropical quality, had been used as a, a preferred training ground. So in other words, uh, from a very <coughs> lush and lavish nature, were suddenly uh, emerging more or less metropolitan uh, buildings. Uh, sometimes even uh, over 20 kilo, uh, miles removed from the original downtown of Portman. So where in the beginning, Portman's cluster is the cluster which everybody sees here. After six years of clustering here, there was one leap uh, toward a uh, uh, kind of perimeter and circular highway, and then in the years that came after, there was no end to the leaping, no end to the moving, no end to the explosion of downtown. And my biggest interest in uh, uh, this situation 
my interest as an architect in this situation was generated at the moment uh, uh, that I saw this uh, uh, photograph, this picture, where two buildings uh, in a competitive sense were being advertised, but it turned out that both buildings were done by the same architectural firm. So at that point, uh, I began to uh, document and to investigate which kind of firm was working in, or could, was able to work in a similar uh, situation, in the situation of Atlanta, and more importantly, how the explosion of volume, the explosion of mass, were dealt with uh, in architectural firms, and what the impact on the profession of architecture of the explosion of downtown or the explosion of the city was. And here is maybe a no more perfect cadaver as key as this one, the hyper modern building and the almost Stalinist building uh, this done by the same uh, architectural office. I went to look in these uh, offices and it did not uh, take long to discover that uh, the offices would be manned by maybe 300 people, uh, the average age would be 23, uh, and the oldest partner would be 31. Uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of, the, they were housed in usually uh, idyllic uh, situations. The uh, partners were extremely uh, accessible and eager to talk uh, about their work, would take me around in uh, uh, the workshops and uh, explain to me their, their pressing issues, issues which, by the way, uh, formed a very plausible explanation for the application of postmodern architecture because it seemed to be the only architecture that could be generated quickly enough to deal uh, with the demand. But one of their, uh, one of their serious, most serious problems was that uh, complexes that which were uh, designed uh, to uh, uh, be symmetrical turned asymmetrical because of the pressure of development. And this was a dramatic example. Here, suddenly in a process of uh, improvisation, five months after starting the lower part, uh, the higher part had to be added. And here was another one, a parking lot in the back, which was going to uh, have three individual buildings, and the individual buildings turning into a kind of uh, caricature of a graph of development. The average designer in the office was a Harvard laundered southern boy who uh, uh, got his instructions uh, freq frequently uh, over the phone and whose uh, work of one afternoon was, uh, <laughs> uh, was presented uh, here. Uh, was presented here and, uh, uh, and, and but, uh, I, I hope that there is not a hint of condescension in your, in your laughter, because it certainly is not in my description. These people were dealing on the front line with an architectural panic uh, situation. So <laughs> uh, I became more and more fascinated uh, on this tour, spoke to more and more developers, and realized that actually the word architectural panic was not uh, exaggerated uh, when, for instance, uh, I met uh, after I had uh, already uh, become, I don't want to say friends, but acquired a certain intimacy, when I was at that point led to, in one office, to the secret room. And it was the secret room because it was uh, about as big as this one, and in it there was an enormous um, model of a section of Atlanta, and in this section of Atlanta, the architects were working on the individual projects that uh, clients, uh, had commissioned to them without knowing that other clients were commissioning projects uh, on neighboring blocks. So uh, here was the secret room. In the secret room, there were, and, and it is very important to notice that, that basically the texture of the model is the classic American suburb with one story houses. In this secret room, the work being developed by the single firm, four buildings, each larger than Rockefeller Center. Uh, completely, apparently, randomly placed uh, in the landscape uh, without any uh, visible connection to infrastructure and also uh, each and uh, every one in themselves an extremely convincing uh, composition but uh, uh, con consciously and intentionally oblivious to any of the other ones. And here is the uh, further picture and uh, this is a typical context uh, of the uh, implantation. And, of course, the, the word panic is not exaggerated when uh, you see that uh, at the last moment the table had to be enlarged <laughs> to, uh, 
to receive and accommodate one further uh, Rockefeller Center. So, it is possible now that any point uh, of Atlanta, and I hope that everybody understands that by this point, Atlanta is nothing but the metaphor of the world, uh, there could be uh, an explosion uh, of density, uh, even if that explosion of density is not in any way connected to the traditional uh, interpretation we have of city as a continuous field or a city of, uh, as an area where the individual parts reinforce each other. Uh, it is possible uh, at any uh, point to have uh, extremely brutal and very often ugly containers that uh, uh, accommodate uh, a wide variety of uh, uh, activities with uh, an amazing uh, flexibility and, and uh, coolness. And it is uh, possible that any uh, of these uh, parts of the world are turned with uh, incredible savage competence into uh, idyllic uh, tapestries that connect those points of density. And at this point, I, I want to kind of introduce uh, uh, a word of self-criticism, but also of warning. It is extremely tragic, of course, that uh, the profession of architecture is completely removed uh, from this world, and that uh, as a uh, collective profession, we hate the materials, we hate the aspirations, we hate the smells, we hate the vegetal perfection, we hate the saps, uh, turbo, we hate the colors, we hate the activities, and in short, we may simply hate the people who uh, uh, actually uh, 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 live and work uh, under these uh, uh, superb conditions. Uh, in the last uh, um, example, uh, an example of where I have come back on Portman, because Portman is a kind of uh, person who comes back again and again in this uh, story, not to be outdone in the uh, stakes, Portman, Portman had to make a leap uh, beyond the perimeter and moved uh, uh, in the project called North Park, and uh, the text is uh, self-explanatory, uh, 60 miles beyond uh, the periphery. And this is a sketch of North Park, and of course you can uh, laugh again, but you can also say, is, haven't uh, we seen these forms before sometimes? Or actually, uh, if you only disregard the rendering, are they maybe uh, kind of uh, accidentally uh, unbelievably beautiful? Or uh, is it maybe kind of finally possible to say that uh, there is a uh, sinister connection, for instance, between these towers and the towers that uh, at the beginning of the century were launched by Malevich um, in uh, an, a leap of faith and a leap of the imagination, a leap that could encompass and, and uh, uh, anticipate on uh, an enormous uh, reservoir of, of events uh, that would follow, is it what is the connection between these two architectures and what uh, is, and is there a connection and, and if there is a connection, how does it come that we don't play uh, uh, as a profession any role in this connection? So if you can see uh, Atlanta, and, and maybe that is the metaphor I would like to propose for you, as a mixture of two uh, extremely potent uh, uh, imaginations at the beginning of the century. On the one hand, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright with his War Acre City, which was nothingness with points of uh, uh, concentration. Uh, then you can see maybe Atlanta as a combination of Broad Acre City and Malevich. Uh, and then maybe uh, this image becomes uh, actually rather touching because it is kind of a, a bimbo selling uh, a combination of Malevich and Broad Acre Cities to other bimbos. <laughs> and, <coughs> but maybe, but maybe uh, it is a, a condition which uh, uh, ought to tell us uh, a lot about uh, architecture today. And it is also, I think, uh, extremely uh, sinister for our profession that somehow in this world and in this dialogue that there are completely parallel worlds and that we have absolutely no connection to them. <laughs> 
And for that reason, I wanted to uh, end with a kind of series of juxtaposition uh, and with one statement. Like, and maybe the statement is the best with the bimbo picture. Um, Uh, like a nuclear warhead, the idea of the city has been dismantled. The city is now a constellation of densities, forever avoiding a condition of critical mass. Density can now only exist on condition that it is surrounded by nothingness. And if we look what has happened to, uh, and what is the reason that architecture, uh, the official architecture, the architecture being taught in the schools, the architecture that we are all ourselves involved in, is so completely disconnected. Uh, I think that maybe this particular image is very telling because uh, it has a pretension of control. The way in which the question is formulated is already condescending. Uh, it implies that uh, the question whether the cities can survive uh, depends in some form of the architects uh, and the urbanists uh, in the world. In other words, it, uh, it, it is the beginning of a uh, bifurcation between the path of modernization, on the one hand, the inexorable progress, uh, I don't want to say progress in the, in the ideological sense, but the, the pr inexorable flight forward of the urban uh, civilization, and on the other hand, the turn uh, the wrong turn taken by the profession, which can only talk about kind of order and control, and it was typical that Bernard in his lecture misread uh, uh, regularity for reality, or reality for regularity. Um, it is, uh, and what especially, and I think that this image is maybe clear for what's happened, what is tragic is that at the beginning of the century, there were still in our official architecture with Malevich and Frank Lloyd Wright uh, sparks and imaginations which were large enough to encompass anything that happened. And in a paradoxical way, maybe Atlanta is a demonstration of this largeness. But you can see that as uh, the 20th century uh, went along, just like a weather pattern, there is uh, a kind of fatal tendency of architecture and the, the march of urban civilization to grow in a radical way apart. Because you could say, what can architecture do about these uh, conditions? And these are the conditions, the pervasive conditions uh, of our life now. And what do any of us uh, have to do with it? And what uh, have any of us, in terms of fantasies, to uh, inject anything to it? And you can also ask, uh, really, with this situation, is this uh, in any way an answer, or is it uh, pole vaulting with a pole which is too short to ever uh, uh, jump over the <laughs> necessary obstacle? The same thing you can hear uh, is in this uh, situation of the contemporary city, is it really necessary to invent more connection or more coherence? If this exists, is it really interesting to imagine this? If this exists, do we have to celebrate this? Is, uh, sorry Peter, it's, uh, it's a compliment. Is this, uh, is the, <laughs> if this is the uh, uh, reality, uh, is it helped by this? Uh, if this uh, is the uh, pervasive reality, uh, does it make any difference to this pervasive reality if we, in ret retrospect, as architects, uh, discover chaos and fractal uh, aesthetics uh, and uh, are in danger of making it our next style? In fact, of the fact that the whole, in spite of the fact that the world in itself is already uh, fractalized beyond our wildest imagination. Uh, I want to. <laughs> Uh, come back to, uh, once again, to uh, John Portman. Uh, uh, John Portman lost nerve, uh, or uh, playing North uh, Town, of course, he couldn't t entirely abandon downtown. So I want to show one recent uh, plan, project, projected for downtown, a tower where he finally abandoned the more or less modernistic jargon to find one 
uh, other uh, skyscraper. And maybe most interesting of all, and this is a real secret image uh, taken there, a kind of sudden abandonment of the Portland ethos of closed volumes. And here, uh, for everybody who has been in the AA in the last uh, 12 years, an amazingly touching relic, uh, or I should not say invasion, a ripoff of Leo Creer's uh, uh, conception uh, for the European city. Uh, too late, probably, <coughs> to uh, rescue American downtown. Uh, too inept, uh, probably, to uh, deal with the uh, very difficult uh, conditions of downtown. And actually, maybe uh, in the context of this uh, discourse, uh, a moment of weakness. And it may be no coincidence that uh, Portman uh, uh, recently has been struggling with the receivers. Um, this uh, lecture, uh, in, as far as I uh, is concerned, or this presentation, uh, presentation for Alvin, is really uh, ultimately to do with uh, uh, in making an inventory and the description of how those two ways that were beginning to uh, fall apart, how far they are uh, apart at this moment. Thank you very much. Just, um, just while we have media control in one place, let me say we'll reconvene in half an hour, and those of you who want to hear Elizabeth Boyarski, it will be replayed uh, right now. Half hour, we reconvene? We reconvene in half an hour. <laughs>